One, his given name, Stokely Carmichael. At two years of age, his parents brought him to New York, where he went on to attend the Bronx High School of Science. In 1960, he became involved in the student faction of the Civil Rights Movement. Soon he attracted headlines as head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He's credited with first calling for black power. And then he attracted great news media attention when he and many others began to agree with Malcolm X's contention that everyone had a right to self-defense. Here you are talking about you afraid of violence and the hokey drafting you out of school to go fight in Vietnam. and you ought to tell them if violence doesn't work then they ought to try non-violence in Vietnam or get off the pot. Get off the pot. <laughs> but then finally on the subject of violence we want to make a philosophical approach to it. The existentialist philosophers talk about the execution of victim relationship that is always prevalent in most of the world today, especially the non-white world, where they are fighting for their liberation. He says there are executioners and their victims. The executioners are self-imposed. The victims begin to fight and agitate for their liberation. They use all types of means to get their liberation. The revolutionary philosopher Franz Fanon says that what happens is that the victim begins to agitate. He uses all types of means against his executioner in fighting for a position of equality. After he tries a number of means and they do not work, he then begins to imitate the means by which his executioner cuts him down. That is usually through force and violence. He says, and then they begin to use it against them, breaking the one taboo that they've never been able to break, hitting back against their executioners so that you ought not to be upset if we are violent the United States taught us very well how to be violent. Well, the civil rights era is over, despite the fact that the grievances raised back then persist today. Our guest is a resident of Guinea nowadays and is known as Kwame Touré, widely recognized as a major fi figure of our times. Welcome, brother. Well, it's an honor to be here with you and to see that you're still struggling. You know, so many fall by the wayside. You've noticed. I noticed. <laughs> but some just keep getting stronger, and you're one of those who keep getting stronger. Well, it takes one to call one. Well, I know it. You know, like we used to say in the 60s, we don't want race horses, we want war horses. All right. How are you doing, really? Well, I'm doing well. I can't complain. You know, I've had some about with cancer, <clears throat> which was discovered here in New York, uh, thanks to uh, an excellent doctor, uh, Dr. Barbara Justice Mohammed, who's a cancer specialist in her own right, plus eight specialists, plus so many other specialists. Yeah. But above all, she's a conscious uh, doctor, uh, organized a group of physicians here who, when I fell sick, took care of me, and uh, I had some radiation for the prostate cancer, and after the first stage, I went to Cuba for uh, the uh, second stage of uh, treatment, where uh, I found a perfect uh, herbalist doctor. You know, in Cuba, unlike in other countries, they don't fight the herbalist doctors for the benefit of the multi... Uh, drug corporations, you know, they fight, they give them encouragement, they respect them. So Cuba has some of the best herbalist doctors in the world because of this. And this was, of course, along with other reasons, uh, choosing Cuba, this was also one of the reasons. So now you're back in New York and you're planning to go back home to Guinea? I'm on my way to Guinea. Uh, this is the first time in over 25 years that I've been this long out of Africa. It's a long time. <laughs> what have you been doing uh, in Guinea all these years? Uh, you come back periodically to lecture, we know that. Well, uh, in Guinea, I'm a member of the uh, All-African People's Revolutionary Party, which is a party that was founded by uh, Osaji for Kwame Nkrumah. And this party is a Pan-African party. It has uh, bases throughout the world, certainly within the United States of America. And uh, part of my job, following the dictum, not just of Nkrumah and Secretary, but of Malcolm X, who says that if we want power, we must put our bill, our power base at home and then extend there. Our party has been following that building our base at home, and then having the diaspora feed into that base at home. So uh, my work is to organize this party as an organizer. We have many, many, many organizers. I'm only one of them to organize this party. And uh, we've been able in the last uh, three decades, less than three decades anyway, because the party was uh, formed in 
visualized in 1967. Mm. We started moving in 1969. So, uh, it was visualized that early? Yeah, 1969. It found in Kwame Nkrumah's book, The Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. Oh. One of the greatest honors I had in my life was when I met him in Guinea. He let me read that book in its manuscript form. Oh. You know, what it solved all the problems I've been looking for. And uh, we've kept the base in Africa and we spread all around now. Uh, we've got bases in America. The United States of America, we have it in Central America, in uh, North America, in uh, the Caribbean, we have it in uh, England, we have it in North uh, America, Canada, in uh, all of all Africa. So we have it in uh, major places where Africans have been uh, spread. We have not gotten into the eastern part of the world just yet, but of course as we get stronger, mm -hmm. we'll definitely hit that area. Where it has it that you were a persona non grata for a while in Trinidad, does that still exist or has that been diluted? Do you know they just, they just changed the whole thing, you know? What? <laughs> yes, boy! <laughs> they got an Indian government now! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kidding them, you know, they, came, they brought me back to Trinidad two weeks ago. They gave me a welcome fit for a king. What? Well, I'm telling you! So I said, uh huh, I see. So now they got an Indian government. <laughs> Only African government could ban me. <laughs> Back to Guinea. What, what attracted you uh, to take up residence in Guinea? Revolution. 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 I went to Guinea. When I went to Guinea, was the uh, most uh, revolutionary country in Guinea at that time. Uh, Co-presidents were Secretary and uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, everywhere we were on the front lines defending Africa's dignity. Everywhere on the front line expanding the African Revolution. So I went there for revolution and. Uh, I've been very honored in my life. I was able to serve uh, both of them and uh, learn, of course, a lot. Commit, uh, at a young age, uh, many serious missions for the African Revolution, which gave me a great deal of experience. But well, one, one would argue your battlefield was on this side of the Atlantic. Well, not be difficult to say that when in Trinidad you just told me I should come home. <laughs> <laughs> in that aspect of life, I've been very fortunate. I've born the Caribbean, so I have ties there. I spent uh, much struggle here, did much struggle here in the United States, and of course I spent over 25 years in Africa. So uh, the people in Africa give you a little run for your story too, especially in Guinea. They're telling me, no, no, if you're going to die, you got to die in Guinea, so you better come all back. <laughs> Were you invited by Sekou Touré? Uh, by both Sekou Touré and by Kwame Nkrumah. It was uh, Kwame Nkrumah, they were both co-presidents at that time. And uh, after having been invited there for the 8th Congress of the Democratic Party of Guinea, of the African Democratic Revolution, of which I now have the honor of serving as a... Uh, Committee Central member, and uh, part of our work is to bring our party back to power after much, much, much oppression by uh, French neocolonialism. But of course, we're going to uh, overcome this task. Uh, when I went to say goodbye after spending some time there, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, he might have been joking, he said, Well, uh, where are you going? I said, Well, sir, I am uh, going to uh, Tanzania, where I'll hook up with uh, some of the liberation movements, and uh, I'll probably fight with one of those liberation movements. He said, Well, that's a worthy task, you know. Uh, and it's good that, uh, you know, almost like fans for now, and you're coming to shed your blood and bad listen. But uh, I thought maybe you'd like to come and be my secretary. I said, what? <laughs> he said, well, you know, you're here. If you're just going to, you know, fighting is good. But you guys said, oh, I'll be here. <laughs> so I said, I'm coming out. I said, don't worry. I'll come back. I'll write you. So that's just how, I mean, I just couldn't say anything. I couldn't believe it. But I'm going to give him a chance to think. <laughs> what sort of a man did you find uh, Mr. Nkrumah to be? Nkrumah was a great man, obviously. That's uh, number one. Two, I've read a lot of accounts about him in his uh, later life, which are just untrue. Uh, in no time at all did the Osage folk ever become discouraged. On the contrary, he knew exactly the plans that he had seen and laid out for Africa would fall exactly in place as he'd seen them, which, of course, they are falling exactly in place. He foresaw he, everything that was seen he today. He foresaw everything. Even we used to scream about military regimes. He said military regimes have no tradition in Africa. Do you know what's a fact in Africa in the olden days? If you were my chief and I was your chief of staff, military chief of staff, when you died, I committed suicide and went with you. Yes! It just seems backward, but politically it's the best thing. There's no chance for the usurpation of power. They're saying because each political man brings in his own power. And then Kruma pointed out, if you look at all the struggles in Africa, they were all carried out by political people. And Zynga, who fought the Portuguese for 17 years, she was political, not military. Even Shaka Zulu, who came to organize all the union for the struggle coming, he was political, not military. Uh, Samuri Toure, he was political, not military. So if you look very carefully at Africa's heroes, they're all there. He said it has no tradition. He said imperialism is imposing it. It won't last more than a generation. And uh, we can see it's, it's finished. It's finished. There's still some corpse running around, but it's finished. Okay, let's take a break. We'll have more right after this. Uh, had, gave, had given you and Mr. Um, Kwame Nkrumah sort of predicted that with 
the liberation struggles that they were involved in, that there would be an ebb afterward? Of course. And uh, decline, and then it would come back again. Of course, in Krum, of course, in, uh, in the turn of this century, the great V.I. Lenin wrote a book entitled Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. It's a fantastic book, and anyone who's struggling for peoples must read this book. And Nkrumah wrote his book, and his book was called Neocolonialism, the Last Stage of Imperialism. And very few people, of course, paid attention to it because nobody pays attention to anything coming out of Africa. What can they tell us, especially about revolution? Even today, they dismiss Sekou Touré and Kwame Nkrumah as great thinkers because they were not, you know, they're just Africans. But um, it's correct. And if you look at Africa in um, Liberia, which uh, represents, for those who don't know very much about Africa, a stable and democratic, the most stable and most democratic country in Africa created by America. That country is destabilized today by American imperialism because the military regimes are incapable of exploiting the people. So they now want to go destabilizing the entire African continent as if they're going to come back and show that we're incapable of ruling ourselves because, you know, you can't do anything without the white man, etc., etc. Why all they're doing is pushing the level of political consciousness to a point of pan-Africanism overnight. The youth in Africa speak of nothing but pan-Africanism now. The continent must be unified. It's the only chance. What good is our Liberia? What good is the Sierra Leone against these powers? We must be so. Even the, even the reactionary elements want a unified Africa. The Africa or socialist Africa. We don't struggle because the masses will vote for socialism. But uh, that's the only dividing point now. A unified Africa is no longer a point of contestation. Right, we're going to come back to Africa, but let's, let's jump over on this side of the Atlantic. What's your assessment and analysis? of the situation here. Is there, are there par parallels here between the uprisings of the 60s and now the period of decline, such as what you talk oh. about in Africa? Okay, now I've never followed this theory of, of period of decline. Uh, all struggles uh, go through uh, different forms. As we say in revolution, struggle is multiform. Right. So if we just take, let's just take briefly the United States, our struggle here. Yes. In the 1950s, the early 1950s, the dominant form of struggle was the legal form of struggle in the courthouse taking case to the Supreme Court. And this struggle was mass struggle. It was followed by the masses who gave their pennies to the NAACP. Because if you got caught with the crisis, the magazine of the NAACP at that time, you'd be lynched. The house would be burnt. You'd be finished. Mm -hmm. And when foot soldiers were needed, when these cases were broken down, it was the South, the again, who provided them. So there's no question it was a unified struggle. Mm -hmm. By 1956, the dominant form of struggle began, became contested by Martin Luther King with uh, nonviolent boycotts. And then if you look, it's spread by the, if we go to 1965, the first uh, re urban rebellion of the 60s, Watts, by 1965, it changed to urban rebellions. So if you look carefully, struggle is multiform, but struggle is all the time. Sometimes you can't see it. Some people couldn't see the use of going to the courthouse in the 1950s. Some couldn't see the need of Martin Luther King's uh, nonviolent demonstrations. Some cannot even see the, the need or the use of uh, urban rebellions. But there's no question these are the forms of struggle take. And uh, the struggle has taken a deep form, one of the deepest forms it can take, which is an ideological struggle since the late 1960s. And most people who are not involved in struggle have not seen this, so they think nothing is happening. But um, when a, about uh, six years ago, if my memory serves correctly, when Jesse Jackson and some other people called a meeting and said, we must now call ourselves African Americans. Of course, I never use the term African American, I just use Africans. But when they said that, it showed the lack of struggle was coming because as a people, we in this country, all of us will define our origins as different. Ask any of us, what are you? Well, I'm black. What are you? Well, I'm black American. What are you? Well, I'm American. Well, what are you? Well, I'm human. Well, what are you? Well, I'm African American. What are you? Well, I'm African. Well, I'm Belalian. If you listen to us, we have so many different names to call ourselves. Therefore, since we come from the same origins, we cannot be unified. Even in mythology, the people have to have a common origin for their mythology to hold them together. And we who have a common origin, unquestionable thanks to our color, if nothing else, are the first ones to find their differences. But this illogical struggle has been occurring with an intensity inside our community over questions that have really been looping. When you just take the position our people has jumped on the question of Africa from the 1960s to 1990s, why even the Honorable Marcus Garvey, peace be upon his name for all the work he did for us, could imagine this jump. I mean, when well, you say in 1960s, you went from Negro to black, you had a fight when you called him black. Well, you should have tried African. <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you have to say about the high number of uh, Africans who are incarcerated in this country, um, the large number of broken homes in our communities? All this is part and parcel Drugs. of all this is the attack against, the, against us. In fact, I am, as a revolutionary, I am enthusiastic about this. Because I know from revolutionary history that when the people get in pre-revolutionary times, the enemy tries, the first thing is drugs. I mean, any, just a, 
a cursory look at revolutionary history will show you in China they pumped in opium. The Chinese took out the opium and whooped them. In Af Africa, when the Algerians got ready to fight the French, they pumped hashish into Algeria. The pumpers of hashish, those who sold hashish to people, became the best fighters to kill French soldiers in Algeria. So everywhere they pump, they can't stop revolution, they can only slow it down. So all this was just to say, oh, so they see how fast the conscience is moving. They've got to drug the community, to drug them into criminality, because it's the only way to get us into criminality, because up to now, the high level of morality we have as a collective force, not individual, but as a collective force. Some people get confused with that. As a collective force, our morality is still very high. So all this is just part of the enemy, so I see it coming. You didn't stop it in China, you didn't stop it in Algeria, guess what? You ain't going to stop it in America. <laughs> what kind of political understanding do you see among young people today? You speak at a lot of colleges. It's growing. It's growing tremendously. People are always condemning the young, but they're not with them. They're always condemning they don't know nothing about. Our young people today have made tremendous leaps. When I hear a sister, 19 years old, come and talk to me about dialectical materialism and she's been studying on it, I snapped my head. I said, well, it took me a while before I understood that. I couldn't get to that when I was about 26, 27. I'm a struggle. I was on the front line. <laughs> and she just said she's been reading the chain of the organization. <laughs> I mean, it's just understood that the struggles, the gains that we made pass on to the people unconsciously. Of course, as a disorganized people, we cannot do it properly. So when they yell at our youth, our youth don't know nothing about history, well, what organization did you join to help make sure that the history was institutionalized and passed on to the youth? None. Shut up. You can't send your child to the enemy and think the enemy is going to give your child his history. That's clear. So since you've made no effort at all to come together with those who want to give their children proper education, proper history of what's going on, now that your children don't know the history, don't be screaming at the children. Okay. Let's take another break. And when we come back, I would encourage you to speak up more forthrightly. <laughs> number of African men gathered in Washington, the Million Man March. How did you read that? Oh, it was extremely positive. Uh, Hitler was fond of saying, and capitalism knows this well, uh, you can tell a lie a million times and the people will come to think it's true. We revolutionaries say, tell the truth a couple of times, you'll smash a million lives. And that's just what the uh, Million and More March did. Um, if you will look very carefully, before that march, I mean, the capitalist media, with all of its lies, had it. We were just this. We were that. We didn't care about anything. We were just drug-filled. We were violence attacked. We were insecure. We couldn't we have no faith in each other. I mean, just garbage. And then one day, all that was smashed. <laughs> one day. <laughs> just starting with that. <laughs> it showed the determination of the people. It once again showed that the African masses are the most instinctively revolutionary group in this country. No group in this country has passed us. After the march of 1963 with Dr. Martin Luther King, they did everything to pass us. They got up to about 500, 700,000. But up till now, no demonstration in this country has surpassed a million and more march. So once again, we're in the forefront of protest in this country. It comes to send a clear message that these people who are willing to sacrifice this day, obviously are willing to sacrifice more, so it gives a clear message. that what they were saying about the people of forgotten revolution, they don't want to struggle, they don't have faith in each other, they just care about money, all that is knocked down the drain. Matter of fact, I see revolution clearer now than I did before October, thanks to the Honorable Minister, Louis Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. Well, now, your theme song has been organized. Always Not so much mobilized, but organized. Now, did you see much of that? No. no coming the, out of the march? No, but the march creates an atmosphere which allows now for organization. If you follow the march very carefully, you know that uh, Minister Louis of Farrakhan and I go back to over 30 years of constant work, of knowing each other, working constantly, of meeting all the time. And um, one of the things that really uh, pleased me was at the march, he ended the march by saying, I want everybody to join an organization working for the people. He even said, join the All African People's Revolutionary Party. I said, now, that's perfect. Because all we want is for all these million and more people who came to the march each and every one of them belonging to an organization, NAACP, Urban League, Southern Christian Union Conference, All African Peace Revolutionary Party, Nation of Islam, anyone that's fighting for the people, you've got a disciplined force. And that's the only thing the enemy has over us right now. Only thing they have over us, we're disorganized and indisciplined. That's all. All right, now in 1963, there was a march on Washington, followed almost immediately by the bombing of the 16th Street Church. Exactly. Now we have a million man march. And so they have to increase. Now we have a lot of bombings, they have to of burnings of churches. What's the connection here that you see? Well, there's two. One, we want to think the first one is that uh, the racists are showing us that uh, just what we know. They're not going to take this one laying down. 
that we have to fight them to the death to get rid of racism in the country. So there's no problem here. Now, when it's properly understood, of course, we're just in discipline organized. Overnight, once we become organized discipline, we can keep this problem at bay. The second problem is a problem that speaks to us. The capitalist system has a way of destroying our thinking. That's its job, make us think illogically. And the one of the way it usually does is makes you think that you're supposed to struggle, struggle, struggle in your life for a certain part of your life, and then after, you get to a point where you don't have to do nothing. I mean, all you do is act like an animal. You just consume. You don't produce anything. I remember as a student at Howard University hearing students say, I'll be so glad when I get out of school. I'll never read another book in my life. And they meant it. <laughs> <laughs> they meant it. So <laughs> what the capitalist system did is that it told us, you all struggle, struggle for a little while. And then you'll be free. What's your problem? You know, so this seeped in, seeped in, pumped in, pumped in, pumped in to even many uh, seasoned strugglers. That, well, you know, I struggled in 60, and now it's time for me to enjoy some of that struggle, you know. So I don't care what you do. You can keep on doing what you do, but I struggled, and I shed my blood, and I'm going to enjoy it, you know. So uh, this thinking is, of course, backward thinking. Uh, Frederick Douglass is absolutely correct. He is precise. Where there is no struggle, there is no progress. And so if we want progress all the time, we must want struggle all the time. But the American capitalist system teaches us to want progress without struggle, to want money without laboring. You know, just one thing, just get them. To want change without fighting. And this is the incorrect attitude that we have to attack seriously that, no, everyone must want to struggle all the time. If Harriet Tubman could take struggle to the grave, so can Gil Noble take struggle to the grave. So can Kwame Ture take struggle to the grave. So can uh, Ms. Bowen take struggle to the grave. And everyone must take struggle to the grave. So we must not look for a time where we do less struggle. On the contrary, we do more struggle. I'll be 55 in uh, three days, 29. Yes. <laughs> and um, the other day someone was saying to me, oh, you're an old man now. I said, yes. I said, don't you want to be a young man? I said, no. <laughs> I said, because what it used to take me two weeks to organize, I can organize in two minutes right now. <laughs> and I'm working on two seconds. <laughs> can, you, can you give me a uh, dispassionate clinical critique of uh, your, mo your movements here in this country uh, during the civil rights movement. What mistakes do you think you made? Oh, well, what are you proudest of? There are many, many mistakes. Of course, the thing I'm proudest of is uh, my constant uh, struggle for the people. And uh, this one, of course, uh, I will wear the pride mark on my grave, on my tomb, that I will struggle till my death. Uh, I think this is the most important because uh, our people in their struggle have the character of being spontaneous. I mean, I'm a revolutionary. You know what I dream about? You know what King dreams about? I dream about bringing about urban rebellion in this country. You know what it takes to bring about urban rebellion in this country? If I had told me, for example, all right, Kwame Ture, the party sends you to uh, 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 Los Angeles. We give you everything you need. You know, just tell us what you need for uh, rebellion. I said, okay, I need at least 80 brothers and sisters who are ready to go down, trained, trained revolutionaries, ready to shed their blood and drop it half of the people, won't compromise. That's what I need. Give me 80 of them. Let me spread them throughout. You pay that salary for me for a year and a half. After a year and a half, I can get your rebellion. But do you know these Africans, here a police got released from a Rodney beating, and without the slightest thinking, without the slightest planning, with no cadre, they all jump up and pull it off. I mean, bring a rebellion to the city that shocks them. You know, so our people, but the problem is it's spontaneous. It's not permanent. It doesn't continue. And this is the error. So okay. some of the errors I've made in my life that I've been correcting is that I've aided spontaneous activity, which had nothing other than spontaneity as its end. It wasn't leading anywhere. Uh -huh. So, uh, of course, I'll stop that. I rectified that error. But I've made a lot of mistakes here. And uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes I made in the 1960s in SNCC was that I saw the importance of ideology, but I didn't recognize the necessity to wage a struggle for it inside of SNCC. And that was an error I made. All right, there's some more I want to ask you on that point, but we do need to take a break. We'll be back right after this. Spontaneous. You're arguing that uh, fundamental revolution really needs to be thought out very carefully. It has to be properly planned. Revolt, rebellion is not thought out, but revolution is. Revolt, rebellion only seeks to vent the uh, anger against the system, but revolution seeks power. And I've been on power since I was a kid, and I haven't changed yet. We need power, and revolution is what brings power. You seize power, revolution. Where do you see things going then? Are you encouraged? Are you saying that you're, in, you're encouraged by what you see here in the United States among oh, yeah. our people? It's a classical English statement. It's the worst of times and the best of times. It's the best of times because our people are more conscious. 
We are more conscious today than ever before. Even though there's a large unconscious sector, but we know that with a conscious sector determined, that unconscious sector can become politicized overnight, as they did in the 1960s, as they did in the Russian Revolution, as they did everywhere else. They can become politicized overnight and join the sides actively for the fight for humanity. So that's not our problem. We are very conscious. So when you have the best of uh, times, which is the rising conscious of the people, and the worst of times, which is the conditions, conditions rolling back the gains that we want, etc., etc., when you have high rising consciousness and worsening conditions, you've got to have a revolt, an explosion. But this one, we want to be revolution, not a rebellion, where we actually seize power. Many have the perception that the Soviet Union, uh, and it is in fact true in many cases, that the Soviet Union uh, supported many of the liberation struggles that we've seen. And they used to talk uh, in global terms about the East versus the West. Now they're saying the North versus the South. Do you subscribe to that difference? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, the Soviet Union itself will prove that because it is clear that uh, irrespective of all the shortcomings of the socialist regime, the people had a far better quality of life than they do now. And that this fight will continue until they seize power again. And when they do, it will be eternal struggle. This but time they will not turn it loose. When you say quality of life, you mean that now they have organized crime there and there's, you no know... Quality of life, just like in America. I mean, insecurity, total. Uh, no security, no health program, no sh insurance that your student, your children will go to college if they want to because nothing, all of the things, rent is costing. I mean, it's just completely, it's doggy-dog. It's, it's, dog. it's, it's New York City. It's New York City. It's doggy-dog. What do you see among our diaspora then, the nations in our diaspora, who uh, many got substantial support from the Soviet Union? That support is no longer existing. What do you say about that? I say that's great. Not only do they get support for us, it's great. One of our struggles, revolutionaries, among other African revolutionaries, was the necessity for an authentic African ideology coming from our culture. Let me just give you an example. Before the 1960s, Marx and Leninism reigned supreme. It was the ideology, not a ideology. To take you to socialism, but the ideology. Now, of course, as an African, I have some contradictions with Marx and Leninism. I point out only two, as a result of my culture. If you're a Marxist-Leninist, you must be an atheist. That means you must say that God does not exist. I used to tell them, okay, I can say, no problem. But my people? <laughs> not in this generation. <laughs> Maybe the next one, but not in this one. <laughs> you know, for them, God and revolution, religion and revolution is one the same. Of course, it's an African cultural question versus a European cultural question. Africa has given monotheism to the world, the first sacred book right. of the world, Judaism to the world, stabilized Christianity for the world, saved Islam for the world. We haven't speaking about African religions now, just the contributions to world religions. Europe never gave any religion to the world. All the universal religions entered from the outside, which means it's out of the culture of Europe herself. That's why they've always had this conflict with religion. I mean, they kill Jews, they kill Christians, they kill Muslims, they kill non-believers at the stake in Europe without the slightest hesitation. It's again because of this cultural problem with religion. But we don't have it in Africa. Religion and revolution has always gone hand in hand. Nat Turner was a righteous preacher. Then Mark Vesey was a righteous preacher. Malcolm X was a righteous Muslim preacher. Martin Luther King was a righteous Christian preacher. Jesse Jackson's a preacher. Minister Louis Farrakhan's a preacher. So if you look very properly, you'll see for us Africans, religion and revolution has never had this dialectical break that it had within the uh, European cultural. So Marxism coming out of the culture of Europe was trying to impose this upon me. Let me give you one example. Once in Greenwood, Mississippi, when I was doing a, a program there of uh, protest against the police, they had, they had filled the jails, but there were young kids and the discipline was breaking down. So I had to go into the jail to establish discipline. So I picked some cadre to go with me just to go to jail and made two lines to confuse the police. I looked up on the line that I had picked and I see an old woman on the end of it. I went back there and said, ma'am, you're on the wrong line. I said, this is like getting arrested. She said, I know, that's what they told me. I said, you ain't going to jail. She said, yes, I am. I said, they're brutal. She said, I know, they brutalized my daughter, brutalized my granddaughter. Now I must go. I said, they don't respect age nor sex. She said, I know. She said, you worried about me, son? I said, ma'am, I'm very worried about you up in there. Don't you worry, son. I got a telephone in my bosom. Soon they touch me, I'm going to call Jesus. He's going to take care of me. Oh. <laughs> what am I going to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> Tell her to take the telephone out of bosom? <laughs> so this has been our struggle. So when we said we were in Krumis to race, coming out of African culture, oh, wow, did we have trouble with everybody. Yeah. But we've seen it clearly. This aspect of your ideology must come from your culture. And so we've been able to show that you cannot export revolution just like you cannot export ideology.
it must be homegrown. Everybody has the same objective. We want a socialist system, a system where everybody's treated equally, where there's no rich mon monopolizing the wealth of the society against the poor. We all want that. But how to get there, our cultures will have to take right. this step. Now we're running out of time. We've run out of time in this segment, but very quickly, you're then saying that the nations of the diaspora, our diaspora, are better off without the sustenance that they were getting from the Soviets? Precisely, especially in the immaterial aspect, because you can be dependent upon Saudi materially and immaterially. And the worst dependence is the immaterial dependence. Okay, let's take another break. We'll be back with more quiet, low-key, laid-back discussion. <laughs> the 60s, that were, there were some who admired and respected Dr. King, but then began to drift away from his some of his philosophies specifically on self-defense and on violence and whatnot. But they remained in love with him, although they were at war with that particular philosophy. You used to have that problem. Uh, and at the same time, there was this feeling about Malcolm X at the same time. Can you sort of give me a recap of your thoughts, if my comments are in any way accurate? Well, they are, except that I didn't have the problem that others had. It isn't because, you know, if you don't know anything about history, you hear the name King, you have to love him. But if you're a student of struggle, like I am, then I'm a no king, so I really got to love him. But I, I spied King's contradiction, contradiction since Montgomery. When he started Montgomery, the racists bombed his house. I don't know if you remember this. They almost killed his wife. He was right on the bedroom, but somehow, by just the grace of God, they didn't get killed because it wasn't time for him to go because he went then and really was in trouble for us. <laughs> so <laughs> King didn't go. So King came out. You know, those Africans in Montgomery, they were steaming. That's yeah. them. And they had meeting and insisted they take a gun and keep a gun in the house. He refused. He said, no, I'm not violent. It's my principle. I'll not take the gun. You know, and they went off. They fought. He refused. They told him, okay, you can refuse to keep the gun in your house, but we're going to put some bodyguards around your house. He tried to refuse that. They told him, no, you ain't going that far with us. And they put bodyguards around his house, and he had to give in to that. So since then, I knew that he recognized there was a contradiction between him and his community on the question of nonviolence. Was there a conflict within Dr. King? D did Dr. King have a conflict within himself on this whole question? Not at all. As a matter of fact, you can see it. Uh, King really taught me a lot if you look at King seriously. King was attacked by Malcolm X. King was attacked by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. King was attacked by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. King was attacked by the Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, what's the old man? Roy Wilkins attacked him. The Urban League attacked him. But if you will look, look King never attacked anyone or never answered anyone. We all attacked him. We all attacked him when we got mad. He was blocking something. Everybody went after him. Any way you can get him, they went streaming for him. But King, he never responded to any of the attacks. Unlike all of us, Malcolm responded, Snick responded, everybody else responded. But King never responded. King actually had, and this is one of the things I appreciate about King, King was honest. I mean, he was totally honest. That's why he was so incorruptible, not only materially, but immaterially, which is most important. And his break over the Vietnam War shows that he could not be corrupted immaterially. That's why the FBI knew, all right, we've got to kill him now, because there's no way to control him. Malcolm X? <clears throat> Malcolm X was a great, great man. Uh, of course, uh, Malcolm X wanted uh, confrontation. He wanted confrontation. And this was his uh, biggest dilemma within the nation of Islam. I'm surprised that I read so many discussions about his, the role of the nation of Islam in killing Malcolm X, and they don't make proper analysis. You know, this was the biggest confrontation they had. Malcolm was suspended because he wanted confrontation with Kennedy. Let's go get him. Chicken's coming home to roost. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, given his perspective, his understanding, was correct when he said, we're not ready to confront them just yet. We've got to build some more. But Malcolm saw King is uh, talking nonviolence, but he's confronting. The students talking nonviolence, but they're confronting. Everybody's confronting except us. And that was his dilemma inside the nation of Islam. So once you understand that and you look, you will see Malcolm X grew by leaps and bounds in his entire life. And that when he left the nation of Islam was what appeared to be the flourishing, but it was just to bring it together of everything because he knew death was at hand. Uh, what have you perceived about the impact that he had in Africa? He met with several African heads of state. What? I remember that John Lewis, our then chairperson of the Student Alvine Corner Committee, followed Malcolm to Africa. He came right after Malcolm. We sent a delegation, oh. invited assembly by Sekou Touré to come to Guinea in 1964. That's how long we've been working. And... Uh, when John Lewis came back, I wanted to hear the report. I wanted to hear the report, so I can't remember where he was going to report, but I got in the car that was going there. And what impressed me about the report was he kept saying over and over, everywhere we went, we were judged by Malcolm X. Hmm. He said, and we couldn't get around admitting the truth of many of his positions. And of course, John Lewis was one of those nonviolent types like uh, Martin Luther King. 
you know, and uh, when he was pushed on the liberation struggles, he had to bend. <laughs> I don't think as much as he bended when he went to inspect the troops in the Gulf, even being a half out of man, but he did bend a little then. What do you have to say about the Panther Party now, in retrospect? Uh, there's no true history written of the Panther. Uh, nobody gives the Panther history its right birthplace, which is Lowndes County, Alabama. The political party? The, they, no, the armed party. It was an armed party. It was an armed party, that's what people don't understand. And no place is better than Lowndes County, where they had racist terrorism, I and mean, they had those Africans terrorized, those racist groups. I thought the Panther Party was formed out of the disappointment of the Democratic National Convention in Philly, in uh, Atlantic City. Yes, and we came to, to, to form it, but it was an armed party for self-defense. Because in Lowndes County, when we entered Lowndes County, our SNCC team, in 1965, there wasn't one registered African voter in Lowndes County. And the county was 87% African. So you can imagine terrorism, and that was just in between Selma and Montgomery. King had a movement in Montgomery since 1956. And it's the borders of Lowndes County, it didn't touch it. We in SNCC had a summer project since 1962, rough project. It didn't touch Lowndes County. Matter of fact, people tell you all the time, when they chip through Lowndes County, they chip through. They said, no, we're going to break this one open. So the only way to break it open was with guns. No other way. The terrorists let us know even before we entered the county. They killed Viola Luisa, and they Lou Luizo, and they just made it clear. Y'all coming to this county? There's number of bloodshed here. So uh, we had to go in armed. We had to go in armed. I got to ask you more. Last segment coming up, and I'll ask him. Stay with us. The um, and the exact opposite of what I suggested. They were political, a political party. They were armed party, and I remember just to have our first. I'll never forget it. To have our first uh, primary vote, the Justice Department man came to me and said, "Well, you know, the law says you got to have it in the other courthouse." I said, "We don't have it in the courthouse." You know. He said, "Well, how are you gonna have it?" I said, "We don't have it in the courthouse." So, you know, so I came before the people, I said, they said we got to in the courthouse, so we got to take our guns and march up in the courthouse. The people were ready. When the white folk in the town saw was ready, the Justice Department man came back. He said, well, um, there's going to be bloodshed. I said, yeah, it looks that way. He said, well, you know, there's a law that says you can have it 50 yards away, 50, a certain amount of distance away from the courthouse. I said, yeah, I know. He said, but the court has to make that ruling. He said, well, the white folk made the ruling. They all can have it in the church. There was a church nearby. So I said, fine. So he said, the church is near the courthouse. I said, yeah. He said, y'all going to have it? I said, we going to vote. You know, he said, well, you know, there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. I said, you tell the white folk they got the first shot. You understand? And everybody came to vote. I'm talking about all women, 75. Everybody brought their guns. We brought it out clear so nobody could see it. They put their guns down. They went. They voted. They came back. They picked up their guns. They were escorted out. So the thing was well organized, and there was guns everywhere. This isn't fair, but I'm going to try it anyway. Give me a snapshot critique of the Panther Party. Uh, well, uh, it had good intentions, the one on the West Coast. Now, I just want to mention one thing. A brother by the name of Mark Comfort is the one who took the Plant Panther Party from Lowndes County to uh, the Bay Area. And in all the books I've read in the history of the Bay Area, none of them mention his name. None. One of them. And he's the one who's done it. And those who are alive know it. Bobby Seale knows it's Mark Comfort. He knows it very well. Elaine Brown, maybe she came in later, but she must know it's Mark Comfort. So uh, many of them who write just leave him out completely to give the myth as if they created the Black Panther Party, which they did not. This preceded uh, Huey and all of them. This preceded, preceded Huey and all of them. They were kids in gangs when we were fighting the South. They, we would teach them how to fight. They were fighting each other, you know. The critique. Uh, I think the major one critique about the uh, Black Panther Party is that, uh, number one, Huey Newton, which was the best that it had to offer in leadership, was you need to take him off the scene. And the rest who came were best uh, mediocre, not concerned really with the people's struggle, uh, not understanding precisely people's struggle, and more importantly, not willing to discipline themselves to the rigidity of that struggle, which Huey Newton was. He was willing to discipline himself to the rigidity of struggle. He would read, he would sit down, he would analyze, he would discuss. But many of them, I didn't see it. Matter of fact, I remember one of my biggest fights I had in the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party was to try and introduce a political education program to the rank and file. There was an organization out there called Us. Yes. Were they friends, allies, or foes? They were friends. To they, the should be, they were friends. They should have been allies, but because of, uh, of uh, weak organization on both sides, on the lower levels, they were able to uh, be turned into uh, enemies by the uh, enemy itself. Come, sir. Now, we hear that there were some things that went on with uh, Mr. Foreman, that he was subjected uh, to a lot of pressure, physical pressure, by us. Yes, well, there's uh, no, that might have been true. There's no question about it. But uh, as I'm saying is that once the enemy come in, instead of making the enemy the enemy, but makes us the enemy, well, then there's no whole bar share for people who do not like themselves. So you're talking about heavily infiltrated. Uh, heavily infiltrated. There's no question about it. On every level. And I was in the middle of it trying to stop it.
And I was looking like, if I'm, I don't want war, you know, the Panthers said, we got to kill them. I said, why you got to kill them? We got white policemen running around in Los Angeles. Who crazy? You know, let's off a couple of them. You understand? And let him know that after we off the police, he don't straighten up. We're coming for him. We're just about out of time in this very fascinating talk. But I wonder if you have anything to say to young people who don't know you, who don't know the 60s, much less what went down before then, don't know too much about world affairs. What would you say to them? I will give them the same quote the Honorable Elijah, the Honorable Mosea, Marcus God, Marcus Mosea Gavi has given us all, which is a people without history is like a tree without roots. And what they know, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. I would encourage them to know their history. American capitalism, which is a very individualistic society, would like us to believe that the world begins with us. I even think some people who were born in the 60s think that the world began in the 60s. The struggle began in the 60s, but the struggle began once Africa encountered injustice. And that's been a struggle that's been going on for centuries. Each and every one of us is just a little drop in this bucket of constant struggle. We will pass. The eternal people will be here to continue that struggle. Therefore, they must know their history so they could know precisely what contribution they must make to humanity. This is important. I ain't got no time for that, brother. I mean, with all respect, you're, you know, getting on in years, but I got to worry about getting a meal here and surviving today. I don't have no time for reading. I understand that, brother, but I want to tell you something. If you really know how to survive, then you can really survive. Because I'll tell you what, if me and you got out there in the road to survive, I survive better than you because I know a lot more than you because I read a lot more than you. So if you're going to survive, be good at it. You understand? Come on and read. Don't be afraid to read. Your people gave reading to the world. Africans gave reading and writing to the world. Give me some books that you think I ought to read, then. Na name a book that you think I should start with. Any book? Well, the first book on our book list in the All African People's Revolutionary Party is uh, The World in Africa by W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. Followed, believe it or not, by Capitalism and Slavery by uh, Eric Williams, who banned me from Trinidad for all those years. And even though I banned by him, the book still stayed on our list. You know, it has many errors, but uh, it gives a clear idea of people to see where the wealth comes from that this society creates to call it own. It came from our back, slavery. So um, there are, of course, other books. Any book by Malcolm X, any book by Kwame Ture, any book by, uh, by Kwame Nkrumah, any book by Sekou Ture, <laughs> <laughs> any book by Fidel Castro, any book by Karl Marx, any book by V.I. Lenin, any book by Kim Il-sung, any book by Ho Chi Minh, any book by Mao Zedong, any book by any really revolutionary uh, figure. This is what they should read because revolution is our only solution. Do you have a quarrel with the media as is known today in this society? No, I understand the media is capitalist controlled. And therefore, I expect it to carry out the wishes of capitalism. Uh, anytime we get on the program and we say our mind, we know there's going to be criticisms for you. Uh, when we attack uh, capitalism, when we attack Zionism, we know there will be attacks coming against you. Uh, so it shows that the media is not a free uh, media. Uh, therefore, those of us who use it must know every time we're using it, we're fighting the media we're using to get our message across, to get our point across. We as revolutionaries, of course, don't use it all the time. Reformists are forced to use it, even depend upon it. We don't depend upon it. How, do you, uh, how, would, how would a youngster reconcile what you're saying about reading if they don't get these kind of books in school? Should they be cautious about the formal education that they get? There's no question about it. We must tell them the truth cannot be hidden, but you will not find it unless you look for it. Some people think they can sit back on television and get the truth. No, maybe with a Gil Noble once in a while you can do that. But uh, you don't get the truth from anywhere except you go search for it. Did you, get, did you get it at Bronx Science High School? I searched for it. What I got from Bronx Science, and I will always thank them for it, is the way to utilize my energy and the discipline of study to arrive at uh, my objectives. I see. And that they really gave me that because they disciplined students there. And, of course, I took that discipline and used it for revolution rather than for science, which for me is the highest form of science anyway because it's human science, yeah, yeah. which is the highest form. H how about going to black colleges? Oh, well, I went to Howard now. <laughs> and I, I took philosophy at Howard, and I know that uh, I can stand up to any college graduate anywhere in the world who took philosophy, and they can't leave me anywhere. You know? So uh, I, I, mean, I understand the importance of the uh, schooling. For me, Howard was perfect. Uh, I could see and live and vibe in the culture of my people. I could get its history. I was fortunate to have uh, teachers who were excellent at that time who taught me. And uh, I partied a lot, you know, while wow, doing a lot of work. <laughs> I didn't party easy at Howard. <laughs> well, if you played, you worked hard as well in your life. And I thank you uh, on many levels for being with us and for struggling. And we want everyone to join an organization working for their people. Thank you, Gil Noble, for your years of consistency.